Hello, good day. Welcome, everybody. We're very happy that you joined us. We have a great panel conversation today. My name is Mitch Ashley. I'm happy to be the host and moderator of this DevOps Institute uh, Skill Up webinar. Thank, appreciate that you're joining us too. Our topic today is application security, strengthen, secure, and protect. If you're at, evolve in, at all involved in security, or involved, involved in software, you know AppSec is, is certainly hot, become a great topic. Uh, getting a lot of importance and, and focus, you know, that can be good and challenging also. So we have a panel of experts, folks that are very well experienced in AppSec and can talk to us a little bit about some of the topics we're going to discuss today. So I want to thank the folks, the team at DevOps Institute, all of the members, ambassadors, everyone that helps put on these events, as well as the folks from TechStrong Group who also are helping put on this event. As I said, my name is Mitch Ashley. I'm CTO with TechStrong Group, and I'm also a principal at a research firm, TechStrong Research, that focuses on app security and, and cybersecurity in general, as well as some other topic areas. So we want to say just a little bit about our platform that we're doing today's webinar on. This particular platform called Big Marker, it's actually really great for having conversation. You know, the feedback that I get whenever doing panels or engagements like this is everyone really loves it when you feel like you're part of the conversation rather than being talked to. So we're not going to do any slides. We have an outline of some things we're going to talk about and discuss, but we want you to discuss that with us. So please jump in on the chat. You're welcome to post comments and thoughts and things there. You can post questions there. You can also post your question in the Q&A section. And we'll weave those into the conversation. If it's topical right then, you know, one of us will bring it up if it's something we might get to or kind of help direct and guide our conversation. You never know where, the, where this is going going to go because a lot of it is directed by kind of where, where you are and what you contribute to as part of the conversation. So let's jump right to our panel today. Uh, I'm just going to go do a little round robin and ask each person to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about the company that they're with. Let's start out with Manish Gupta, CEO with Shift Lab. Manish? Yeah, hi. Greetings. Uh, thank you, uh, Mitch. My name is Manish Gupta. I'm the founder and CEO of uh, Shift Left. Great. And can you say, just say a little bit about what Shift Left does? Sure. Um, we are, of course, an application security company. And as the name suggests, uh, we believe uh, we need to insert application security in the developer workflow so that we can fix more vulnerabilities and reduce application risk, which after all should be the goal of application security. Great. Thank you, Manish. Uh, Julius, Julius Masso, uh, who is CTO and co-founder with MergeBase. Hello. Yes. Um, exactly. That's Mitch. You stole my thunder, Mitch. Um, Give away all your secrets all yeah. in one. <laughs> uh, yeah, so MergeBase is a SEA uh, company, software composition analysis. Uh, so that means uh, it's a tool that you can use to figure out, you know, the, the pieces that your application was put together from, right? All the, you know, the DLLs and JAR files and libraries, all those good things, um, you know, will help you figure out all those pieces and then what the versions are and if there's vulnerabilities, if there's license issues, that kind of stuff. And um, yeah, uh, our claim to fame at MergeBase is um, that you can, you know, point at it at those during the build time, source time, or also at runtime and production. You can even, um, you know, instrument the libraries to like find out if they're actually being executed, which, <laughs> you know, pretty, oh, I guess it's that way. Similar to uh, some of the capabilities of contrast, actually. It's kind of cool. interesting take on that in some regards. Excellent. Thank you, Julius. Uh, Curtis, Curtis Barker, how about you? Hi, thanks, Mitch. Uh, nice to be with everyone today. Uh, as you say, Curtis Barker, based in the Bay Area, uh, I work for Resilian. Um, Resilian is a DevSecOps automation platform uh, focused on um, automating all of the aspects around uh, securing the uh, software development lifecycle from uh, application security to platform security to runtime security, but all the way across the, uh, uh, the DevSecOps pipeline and uh, done so in an extensible way that works with um, the tool sets that the organizations have, the, the various and varied tool sets within a single organization, let alone the multiple organiz organizations that are out there. And one of the focuses that we have is making sure that we can give 
um, developers and security teams their time back and provide a platform that reduces friction between those organizations by um, up-leveling the amount of fidelity in information that they get to make decisions around what to prioritize, what's important, uh, and what to fix. Uh, so, you know, that's pretty much the focus for us. And uh, as we move forward through the conversation, I can't wait to tell you more. Great. Very good. Uh, Stephen Walters from Everbridge. Stephen? Uh, hi. Uh, thanks, Mitch. Uh, good to be here. Uh, I'm a, a solution architect uh, with Everbridge, and I specialize on the critical event management for digital uh, side of things, uh, most specifically the XMatters platform. Um, we're about providing service reliability and service availability, uh, ensuring that platforms uh, are maintained and continue to, to, to run, uh, not least within the security aspects. So uh, anything that's happening within both production and non-production environments will be there to help integrate tools, platforms, people, ensuring that information is passed through. It's about getting the right information to the right people at the right time. Um, uh, I'm also a DevOps Institute ambassador. Very pleased to be working with several people in the DevSecOps area around that. Been doing quite a bit of work in that area recently. Um, myself being in DevOps transformation for 15 years, and I don't know if you can tell, but 30 years in IT does take its time a little bit. <laughs> We can, I, I can attest to that for sure. Uh, last but not least, uh, Jeff Williams, and of course, many of us, many, many of us know you, Jeff, from your work for OS, or so thank you for joining us. Tell us a little bit about you and Contrast Security. Yeah, thanks, Mitch. It's great to be here. Um, Contrast Pioneer, well, so I'm, I'm the CTO and uh, founder at uh, Contrast, and Contrast pioneered the use of instrumentation for security purposes. So that covers products like uh, categories like IAST and RASP, and we do SCA using instrumentation as well. Uh, really, our goal is to help companies transform themselves from kind of where they're, they're mowing the grass, finding vulnerabilities and fixing them to companies that are reliably capable of producing secure code the first time. And so we look to reduce things like mean time to remediate vulnerabilities, vulnerability escape rate, those kind of metrics that really show you're making progress. And Contrast platform includes all the kinds of tools we've mentioned here before, uh, vulnerability detection tools for custom code, library analysis tools to find libraries in open source, runtime protection tools that work in production to prevent vulnerabilities from being exploited, even serverless uh, and, uh, and scanning tools. So we've, we've got a kind of complete platform for an AppSec program. Excellent. Very good. Thank you, all of you. And just for our audience benefit, that's probably the most you're going to hear about specific products. We're not here to pitch products. This is a conversation among security professionals. It's one of the things that I really enjoy about the security industry, being, having been in it for 20 plus years, is there is a lot of contributing to each other, both open source and conversation, helping moving the state of the art along, as well as competing. So I think we'll have a great conversation. L let's start out with you know, application security, those two words means a whole heck of a lot. And you could just hear that in our introductions and all the areas that we're, that we're talking about. Uh, let's, we don't have to create a formal definition, but we're, what's kind of a good working definition when we say application security? What all does that encompass? What should we be thinking about as practitioners in, in our respective areas? Um, maybe Manish, if you want to start out first. Sure, thank you. I like to put myself in the shoes of a customer. Um, if they've created an application, and of course the modern definition of an application has evolved, gone from monoliths to microservices to as Jeff was saying, uh, Lambda functions. But if we were to put ourselves in the uh, shoes of a developer or a security, I believe their outcome that they desire is that once they've created this application and hosting it, let's say in the public cloud, how can we make sure that it is not attackable successfully? How can we make sure that the bad guys can't get to it? That to me is the application security, which of course requires that we improve at in, uh, fixing bugs, fixing vulnerabilities during development. Uh, but very rarely do you meet organizations that are able to completely eliminate the attack surface. And therefore there is also a need to protect the application 
in production. See, um, a question for that though. Um, I kind of, I, I totally agree with what you're saying, but uh, and I kind of have my way of thinking of that, which is just 443, port 443. That's application security. Yeah. So I was just wondering, expand the scope a little there. Do people think AppSec uh, also, uh, how does that pertain to you know devices, right? Uh, tablets and phones and Android and Apple phones? Just a question for the panel here. It's, it's, it's interesting. We've been having some discussions uh, recently with uh, a, a lot of other uh, groups and organizations out there that application security isn't just around information, you know, IT. There's also an aspect around OT, around operational technology. So there are a lot of older devices out there that are sitting which are networked, and they are also exposable to potential attack. So that you know, it's it's the the what we define as application security, I think, is becoming broader and all of the time. There are always new things and new elements which we're bringing in. So, you know, application security, as you say, at one time was a monolithic application. Infrastructure as code came along. Do we then treat the infrastructure as code as an application? Yes, we do. You know, things that are sitting within the cloud, containerization. All of these aspects, all of these are things that require security layers and they're things that, that we are required to control. So that, that for me is application security is much broader than just a definition of applications, really, because that's quite fluid. So it, it's, it's funny. I've never thought of the application in application security as like a web app or a mobile phone app. What to me, what it means is software that's applied to a problem. And it's every kind of software, whether it's in airplanes or blenders or industrial factories or anything. Any time you apply software to a problem, now it has a threat context. And now it, you can start thinking about what defenses it needs and why those defenses are correct and effective for defending against those, uh, those threats. And so the application isn't like, well, you know, xyz.com it's all kinds of software anywhere it's been applied to a problem and you can't do security unless the software is applied to a problem because it's totally different you know if you're i use a chainsaw example a lot you can secure a chainsaw for cutting down trees but it's not secure for cutting hair and the context is everything here so to me that's how i think about the scope of appsec all code everywhere making sure threats are properly addressed I, I'm still going to stand up for my part 443 thing because, you know, yeah, I hope my blender's not taking out a domain name, but it is listening on port 443. <laughs> well, yeah, I think. Well, so, I, don't, I don't understand. Like, are you trying to say that, that having SSL is the only thing you need to do for AppSec? Oh, no, more like um, the opposite, the inverse of that. Is in, port 443 is just always open on everything. It's open on the blender, it's open on, on the corporate website, on the internet, and it's always allowed, the traffic's always allowed through there. So that's like that's where the, you start thinking about AppSec because this is the traffic we're letting through. So what's behind it, essentially, which can be anything to your point, yeah. Jeff, right? any kind of software. Yeah, for but it's not even limited to... Right. To HTTP, I mean, that's just a tiny subset of all the software in the world. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I, I agree. I think that is where, uh, you know, both uh, Jeff and Stephen have done a good job of expanding the definition. Uh, and yeah, I stand corrected. It is not about a web app. It is about any software, uh, regardless of where it's running. Does that, I, is I, that I, the point? One, one interesting to thing this? that... I, I'm get, I would I'll just say very quickly to, 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 chip into, to chip into the conversation in. here. Is, is that um, I, I think traditionally it has been defined as what we would think of as a monolithic application, as Stephen said, and it has uh, expanded uh, uh, for sure. Um, and one of the interesting questions is how has that impacted organizational uh, processes uh, and, and um, uh, technology stacks and who's responsible uh, for an application? I think there's been blurred lines there. And that's one of the interesting things, I think, uh, for us all as um, uh, one practitioners, but vendors in the space is how have we been able to uh, reorient how we help these personas within these organizations solve the problem as these blurred lines have occurred because the application sits on an ephemeral platform that changes very dynamic, has a lot of elasticity um, and is in many regards 
you know, at the end of the day, from a risk point of view, which is what um, organizations are really concerned with, uh, from a risk point of view, they're almost inseparable. Uh, and one of the questions I ask um, uh, customers when I'm speaking with them a lot is, uh, you know, who is responsible for the application and how they define the application? Uh, some of the times they've got traditional AppSec teams that really are focused on more traditional application security, you know, kind of um, uh, SAST and, and, and dynamic application security testing. And others, it does encompass um, the platform. It encompasses a lot of um, uh, third party components that are increasingly a part of the application stack as well, hence the rise of software composition analysis tools and capabilities there. So I think it has evolved and it's a really exciting space. Um, but I, from even within organizations, the standardization of how you address um, the stack is, is, is not necessarily fully consistent, um, which, is, which is why I think the challenge for vendors in this space is to provide a, uh, not a one size fits all solution, but something organizations can kind of mold around their own processes uh, and technology stack. I think that's a really good important, really good point because it ties into what we've been saying, which is, you know, what's an app, right? We're really talking about software. And the challenge with that is everything is software, the whole stack, the infrastructure, all of it is software now. And we aren't putting, we aren't wrapping it in, in a protective coding anymore. And that becomes our security layer. It's about how we create secure software for any of those elements. But who's responsible for that? You know, we talk about shift left. It's the name of your company, Manish. But shift left, and is it now all the developer's responsibility to make sure they're creating secure code? Is it, is it something? How does the security team, security organization, how do they play into this? Who owns app security, or how do you divvy out the various responsibilities? Who wants to take a shot at that? Well, so the, the obvious answer uh, is that everyone's responsible for security. But like, uh, you know, whenever you say that, when everyone's responsible, no one's responsible. Um, for security. And uh, there are certain aspects of security uh, that do increasingly need to be uh, uh, the responsibility of developers uh, in order to code right. But at the same time, look, application security, product security in general creates more work for developers. We identify things that they should be fixing. Um, and therefore, for the foreseeable future, I don't see unless we change how developers are are compensated, uh, which is not for fixing security bugs, at least for the large part today, that they will not be responsible for application security. Um, and therefore, there needs to be one, another persona. Now, historically, it's been application security. We are seeing the emergence of DevSecOps, which is sort of harkening back to taking a page out of DevOps. Um, at least that's what we see. I'd love to get other people's inputs too, of course. So I, I, personally, I don't really think that uh, our job in AppSec is to find bugs and, and point them out to developers. Like that's that's kind of the mowing the grass approach, right? Like you're well, just going to keep doing that forever. That point. Okay, I, I, I thought that's what you All said. Right, I guess uh, I, so let, look, let that be the only question where there is agreement. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, look, I think our job is is a little bigger, I think okay, well, uh, you do I'll, need I'll to continue. use the big uh, machinery of software development. About perhaps hold the on, other Manish. Aspects. Oh, Manish, let, hold, let Jeff finish. Go ahead, Jeff. Oh, all right. Oh. I'm sorry, I'm not able to hear Jeff at all. My bad. Yeah, I think you do need to use the big machinery of software development in order to manage the scale of application security. And uh, there's no way for a small AppSec team in a company that has hundreds or thousands of applications all being built to, to deal with that. So. You know, I think it's, uh, the, you know, if there are apps like specialists, their job is to be a force multiplier to try and empower the development teams with the tools and processes that they need in order to be able to scale AppSec. But they can't, you know, they can't just do it all themselves. And it's not just about finding vulnerabilities. It's much more efficient to get in front of things and make sure that they've got a threat model, that they're putting in the right defenses. Uh, and automated testing for those defenses, that way uh, they're much more likely to come out close to the goal. The, the, there's an important element, though, that I think needs to be stressed here that comes from that DevSecOps world. I mean, it's a, a fundamental DevOps principle, which is that we've got to avoid silos. 
the, the, you know, it's how often have we seen it with those old monolithic structures that security has been a silo that's stuck out on the end, and we don't get around to the security testing or checking anything on the security until just before we go live. And then that's when we find the security issue and we have to go back to the beginning again. We can't go back to those kinds of days. So I agree that there's, there's always a place for those AppSec um, professionals, those people who understand, because they're the ones who are going to understand these are the rules that you need to abide by. These are the conditions that need to be set. This is what we need to be testing for. But they need to be part of the overall software delivery lifecycle and they need to be an integrated part of it that ensures they're not part of a silo they need to be integrated into the teams so you're talking about inclusivity you're talking about embedding security at all layers and at all levels within the software delivery life cycle and not just treating it as something separate that somebody else is responsible for Yes, it's Stephen. Yeah, I would yeah. go ahead, Manish. I was, I was just going to chip in there, but go ahead. I'll, I'll jump in after you. I was going to ask the question, and maybe I'm taking this conversation on a different uh, tangent, but so I'll let you add, Curtis. But the question I was going to ask is I agree with Stephen that AppSec application security team needs to be part of the software development exercise. But what happens first? I mean, is do we create the organizational structure first? Or is it the technology or the tools that have to enable that to happen? That that's where Conway's law comes in. At the end of the day, it's about you know having having an organisational structure which reflects uh, in a way the way you want the system to be built, the way you want the system to be operated. So even thinking of it from those basics, if you want security to be embedded in every layer of your system, you need security embedded in every layer of your organisation. Yeah, and I think there's a, there's an increasing need for that. I mean, if if we, like I said, this is a really exciting space, and there's folks on the call that have been uh, leaders in this space for a long time and have seen that change. Um, you know, looking at you, Jeff. <laughs> um, but you know, if we think back to you know um, monolithic um, applications and uh, the development lifecycle, it wasn't it wasn't agile. It was waterfall methodology. Updates didn't happen on a daily basis. They happened quarterly um you know with with the dynamism at which um one uh, software is created but two uh, how much of it is created the volume of software is, that, that's created is significant when i first started out most development um focus was focused toward the internal applications that that company use now as a result of digitization um the uh, applications that are being developed are the revenue generating channels for those businesses by and large uh, so there's they're, they're very significant shifts um and you know i think mark anderson said uh, software um uh, you know code is eating the world uh, and and that's what we've seen it's taking over lots of different processes whether they be internal external processes which uh, drives a need for you to build in security practices into the development pipeline it's kind of like the question you know, who needs to do work? Everyone needs to do work. Everyone, to some degree, needs to be um, responsible for security. But like Manish said, if if everyone's responsible, no one's responsible, which is why there needs to be practices, there needs to be gates, there needs to be automation. And one of the great things that we've seen with developers is they have been great with automation at developing automated tools to overcome their challenges. Why? Because they're coders and they use code to solve some of their own problems. Um, and what it's been a great opportunity uh, being in the security space to work with developers and drive automation um, into their development processes, which means they don't necessarily have to think about security. They need to put in a practice. They need to put in protocols. They need to put in gates. They need to have a policy but automation will help to drive outcomes. So defining the outcome um, uh, early on um, is, is really important. Let's just get real here a little bit. Like, I, I think there's but no the question that software has changed dramatically over the last can for Just 10, for the sake years. of it, can be can run amok. Um, like one of, the, one of the complaints that I have about the SCA industry is the recent phenomena 
of uh, companies finding vulnerable libraries and automatically upgrading them. Now, of course, that only happens successfully for what, 10, 15% of the library. After, the, after that, you know, those library upgrades will break your application. But this runs counter to the very software engineering practice of control change. Um, and we saw this issue, what was it, two weeks ago, where was, you know, this UA parser JS uh, issue came out uh, where someone um, planted malicious code into the library. And if we continue to run these practices where we are just constantly upgrading our libraries, regardless of whether we should be uh, worrying about whether that library vulnerability actually makes my application vulnerable, we are taking additional risk and we are opening the door of yet another attack vector for the attackers to leverage this uh, uh, best, best practice to inject more and more malicious code into the libraries. So um, yes, I think it's important. Um, I've, got, I've got to jump in. Right? Well, <laughs> did, if I, I did a, a webinar here um, with, with TechStrong uh, like a few weeks ago. And at the end, I was like, anyone on the audience, if you want, I'll bet anyone, um, you know, hundred bucks American that within 10 years, libraries will, they'll, libraries upgrading themselves at runtime will be like not a, a, not every library, but a significant practice in the industry. The libraries will just upgrade themselves, right? Just uh, like without any intervention. Uh, Jeff Williams, that was really interesting when you said, let's get real. I was curious where you were going. Oh yeah, thanks. So uh, first of all, on the library issue, the risk of having outdated libraries with known vulnerabilities massively outweighs the risk of a, you know someone introducing malicious code into a library and that finding its way into your application. But that said, uh, the point I was getting at before was uh, software has changed dramatically over the last mm -hmm. 10 or 15 years, no question. And Curtis, you laid out a great, you know, so some of the background of that, all super important, but security, application security specifically has changed incredibly little. So, you know, the, the OWASP top 10 2021 just came out. I wrote, I wrote the first one in 2002, 2003. Uh, it, it's the same stuff in there. And even worse, it's the same, you know, exact vulnerabilities. Uh, that's kind of crazy. SQL the average injection, number of vulnerabilities per application. 15. It's all the stuff we've had for years, right, Jeff? What do you think we haven't yeah. improved? Why haven't, why haven't we gotten better well, about the, those fundamentals? I, I think the market is broken. I think software security is not visible. So consumers can't make an informed choice about whether they want the secure one or the insecure one. And so there's no motivation for uh, software producers to create secure software. Uh, you know, this is the whole market for Lemon's uh, argument that, uh, you know, you, you may have heard in software security. Um, but until we fix the market, we're never going to be able to build secure code. And that's why I'm so excited about, you know, some of the things that are coming out of the executive order, pushing more transparency and visibility through things like SBOM and software security labels and minimum standards for testing. Like those kinds of things change the market. And then uh, we can do all these things that we think we're doing in DevSecOps, but nobody's really doing them because frankly, most AppSec programs are still very waterfall. They think about security requirements. They think about doing security architecture. All is like one big monolithic thing. They think about doing security testing as one big thing. It's not DevOps principles like breaking the work into small pieces, tracking them from development through into production with testing, uh, you know, and, and gradually increasing the security of a, a whole system. That, that's not how we do security. And I, 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 I'd like to come in there because I want to bring together exactly what you've just said, Jeff, with what Curtis was talking about. Uh, and it is a, it's a real challenge that's actually faced the general DevOps world, not just within DevSecOps, but it's, it's really amplified, I think, within DevSecOps. We're technologists. We love our tools. We, we, you know, at the end of the day, we think we can put in automation and that makes everything better. It's the universal panacea. But that isn't the truth. That isn't the real situation. As Jess Humble and his peers put together in, in the CALMS framework, you can't just implement automation on its own. You need the cultural change. You need to have lean processes. You need to be measuring what you're doing. You need to be sharing on that work. 
I, and for me, the, the biggest challenge in all of that is that C. It's the culture. And it's exactly what you put, you stress there, that the upset world is still living in that old, siloed, cultural way. It, it's, a, it's a bit of an oxymoron for the security world because security seem is, is it's about secrets. It's about secrecy. And it's about keeping things to ourselves. But DevOps and DevOps, DevSecOps, it's actually about opening up and it's about being with those people and talking about these things and getting other people together. And, and culturally, that's alien for a lot of people from that traditional kind of uh, upset kind of world. Um, I mean, I'd, I'd love to hear your opinion on that. Do, do you think that's something that the industry itself has to embrace is be more open to cultural change? Oh, yeah. I'll put it this way. The biggest risk to application security is the traditional waterfall mindset. Only when we start really doing, you know, it, it's not, people say DevSecOps and they think it means like staple the old security practices to DevOps. And that's not it. Really, we have to change the way that we do the work of security. What are we producing? How do we produce it? How do we get that work flowing into production reliably? When the work changes, that's DevSecOps. I'm curious, Jeff, um, you know, we use the oftentimes a moniker for that is design security in. It can be that can mean into the process or into the software. But, you know, OK, but what does that mean? What do we do? How do we think about this differently? Maybe you kick off that conversation with us. I just did a keynote at, at LastCon, uh, which I posted to my LinkedIn, if you're interested, that focuses really on this problem. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think the. You know, in, in DevOps, there's a, a kind of a, a critical name for uh, for doing all this, like trying to do all the security up front, like design it in. They would call it big design up front. And it's not a compliment. It's like doing it wrong. <laughs> because I think that it, you need to think about security differently. You have to look at your situation and say, what's my biggest risk? And then design a solution for that. Just that little piece. Maybe it's click jacking. And maybe you say, oh, if you're click jacking, we're gonna, we're gonna use X-Frame Options headers. And then you say, here's how I'm gonna test that so that every outgoing response has the X-Frame Options header set properly. And then I'm gonna deliver that into production and I'm gonna measure it in production so that I know it's working. And then you go back and you do that for the next thing, the next biggest risk. And I don't care what your threat model is, but right now we do this weird thing. We grab some security requirements from somewhere else like PCI or OWASP or somewhere, and we say, that's what we're gonna focus on, regardless of your threat model. Then we build an architecture that is not related to the requirements, it's just like whatever's built into the framework that we're using. And then we test for stuff that's not the requirements or the design, it's just whatever the pen tester happens to have in their head that day. And we end up with almost no security. I've seen people test for SQL injection on applications that don't have a SQL database. What are we doing? We're wasting so much time and we're getting such poor results. It's it's crazy to me how tightly people grip on to those old concepts like security requirements and these old PDF documents that uh, have their security design in them. Uh, and we got we got to stop it. One of the uh, the best AppSec experiences I had as a as a practitioner, as a software engineer, this is like 10 years ago, but I I kind of suspect it would still hold today, is where the company, now, it didn't necessarily identify what is the biggest risk, but they had a, a system that they considered very important, uh, you know, over a million users. And they just, they brought in an outside firm to just audit the code. But the other thing the firm did when they audited the code is they, um, they did some training with the developers too. So they said, well, we've looked at your code and now we want to sit with you guys as a group and we just want to give you guys some you know, show you the way we think about this. And it was like, even during that meeting, um, you know, just with sort of Q and A and brainstorming, we identified like serious flaws. Like you could, you could get log files, you could get production log files just through the, just by manipulating the URL. And um, it was interesting because the, 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 the outside firm that was doing this, this audit and this training, they hadn't come up with that on their own. We never would have come up with it on our own, but together, just bringing in that different way of thinking and having the developers actually exposed to it caused us all to start thinking in this different way. And that, that was an amazing experience. Just so really, to, like, I, I really would encourage 
companies on this call, like bring in out some outside thinking on the AppSec front. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that as well. And, and we've seen this technologically. There's been massive, you know, what the DevOps tool sets have changed over time. Um, you know, some of the, uh, the, the change of landscape in application flaws has, has changed. Um, information leakage and, and cryptographic issues, credential management, cross-site scripting, things that have been long, long-standing floor uh, contributors as it relates to kind of vulnerability security issues. On the other hand, things like buffer overflow have reduced as code bases have migrated from languages like C++ to JavaScript, where buffer management is handled by the language itself. So I, I don't think you know you can stick to a, um, a, a, a religiously a, a, a paradigm of testing that doesn't reflect some of the changes in your code base as it's migrated and evolved over time because you'll end up wasting a lot of time. So bringing in outside help to understand and to to be very real on the maturity of your organization and where the risk lies and how you need to maybe change processes to address the risk, I think is, is really important. And I would say, you know, automation, again, it, 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 I'm not saying it's a panacea, but w where there are DevSecOps oriented teams, you know, I've seen research after research that states DevSecOps drives behavior and a cultural shift. Those teams and those people that are in those teams act as advocates. And, and the outcome of that is they're likely con to conduct more frequent uh, security scans of the code base at regular intervals during the DevSecOps lifecycle. And then that will drive faster fix times as they see more issues. And there's also a lot of data that suggests when issues are seen in the first one month, there's a lot of energy behind fixing them. And then after they kind of move into the backlog and they get added to technical debt. So the more there are advocates that are driving automation and driving process around um, risk visibility and fixing the risk and helping the constituent teams and developers do that, you're going to have better security outcomes. But you do need outside parties, I think, sometimes to come in and uh, be real with you on where the risks are and how you've evolved and your maturity has evolved over time. So let me throw a wrinkle into this conversation. And what I'm bringing this from is um, I host some groups that are CIOs who are talking about the, the environment that we're in. And, and some of them thinking is starting to shift from, you know, investing in prevention, 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 whether that's designing it in or, you know, you know, better technology to, to stop the attacks to, you know, at some point, we every code, piece of code is vulnerable. Every business will be attacked, and every business will be um, successfully attacked in some form or another. You know, not just today, but in the future. It's just a fact that matters. Not if or when, as as already has, and it will again. So the shift, the thinking is shifting to response is equally, if maybe not even slightly more important than prevention. Meaning, don't throw prevention out. We're not talking about doing, stop doing all the important good things you're doing. But your ability to respond when you find something or when you're attacked or you see a threat very quickly, which, so I bring that up because do we need to start rethinking about security as just what the threat model is that you mentioned, Jeff, or that it's DevSecOps and it's built into how we create software, but our ability to respond to anywhere in the software stack, including software that we're writing, is equally important. You can you can agree, disagree, call BS, say you think that's a you know most brilliant well, thing you've heard today, or you know whatever you want to do. So, so, so Mitch, I mean, I, I'm going to straight away say no. That's not a wrinkle. That's actually absolutely essential. Uh, I spoke recently at a DevOps Institute Skill Up Day on DevSecOps, and I mentioned that that exact phrase. I said, "No fortress is impregnable." You know, the, the, the person that's out there wanting to get hold of your valuable information, the data in your system, is not sitting on his laurels using whatever he's got to hand. He's coming up with new methods. He's getting innovative. He's coming up with new ways of doing things. And you can't necessarily develop in advance for thinking what that other person is thinking about. You have to be able to, to be reactive as well as proactive. And, and that's why what, what I state is that there are two key principles. There is the, the, the principle of being uh, proactive, which is shift left, which is about prevention. But there's also about being reactive, which is shift right. 
And it's those shift rights principles of including how uh, development teams, how testers, how business analysts, how AppSec people can work in the operations side of things around exactly that, how we react to those situations. Because at the end of the day, when you're dealing in a reactive situation, every second counts because it can mean the difference between you retaining your data or losing your data. And for your business, that, that can mean the difference between a nothing fine or a huge GDPR fine. So I, I think it is extremely important that we don't just consider the shift left, we consider the shift right, we have to be reactive as well as proactive, and we have to look to implement those in a balance. Talking about... Well, I'll, I'll, go ahead. All right, just a, a quick comment then. Um, when I'm thinking about response, though, in the application security context, uh, maybe this is just me then but i always get depressed because then i start thinking about logs and applications um especially in-house applications right like you know if you're at a bank your online banking or that you've wrote for for your bank whatever um the application logs just are often awful right like they just they're they they're saying a bunch of nonsense you don't care about and then they don't actually tell you that a user logged in and did a transaction like it's like nowhere in the logs so like, um, I'll, yeah, I'll, I, I I'll, totally I'll, agree with that. Give me a call. Yeah. Give, give, give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> so, two things here. First of all, uh, you know, half of of contrast business is monitoring apps in runtime and making sure hmm. that they don't get attacked and uh, preventing vulnerabilities from being exploited and so on. So we have a huge amount of visibility. The average app is attacked thirteen thousand times every month. Uh, and there are no apps that don't get attacked at all. So it's really quite prevalent out there. Really, I think what you're saying is it's not just DevSec, it's also SecOps. It's right in the name DevSecOps. And like mm. that whole SecOps piece is really tough for companies because traditionally we've only had a WAF. Like that's it. That's the only thing that, that worked there. And WAFs are not very good because they're looking at the wrong level. They're looking at network traffic, well, they're trying good to identify for, application layer attacks. They're good for telling your auditors or compliance people that you did something. WAFs they're only good, good for, for saying that you have a WAF. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But this is why I think it's crazy that people deploy web applications without runtime protection. Uh, RAS builds right into applications. It's part of them so they have it has the full context of you know all the transactions that are going on uh you get visibility into exactly what security events you're interested in you can even add uh security events you know to your logging point it's uh you know if you want to enhance your visibility you can put sensors on methods that you care about and say hey here this user just did this authentication or this access uh check or, or whatever Do you but find it's, always... it's really getting to what i call security observability do and it's not those? logs, it's continuous monitoring. Mm -hmm. I find though, when you go even deep into the runtime like that, um, often the user has been decoupled from the transaction that's happening because it's being thrown into a queue and it's being like, you don't have the IP address anymore. You don't have the MAC address because it's all being decoupled. And so it still makes traceability and response hard. I, 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 don't, I don't agree. Not entirely I, true. I, I, I agree with Jeff here in that there are those tools that those monitoring tools and those capabilities to get you that information but what is just as key is about making sure that information is enriched and you're not getting information from just one data source there are multiple locations and and, and various tools and assets you've got to hand that will help you to understand exactly what is going on with an attack and help you to actually handle that and manage it and deal with it in an appropriate kind of time scale so yeah, but it, it's best to prevent those vulnerabilities from being exploited. And you know, you, Curtis, you mentioned buffer overflows. That's a good example of where advances in things like you know compiler technology and ASLR and DEP made a whole class of vulnerabilities very difficult to exploit. RASP does the same thing at the application layer for things like SQL injection and XXE and expression language injection and uh, and so on. Uh, that's the way that we make real progress, you know, like in the public health sense, we make real progress against uh, some of these epidemics. Yeah, I, I would just say, just coming back to your point, um, uh, Mitch, is that it's, it's, it's ironic 
actually, you, you, as we talk about, you know, the protection of uh, applications in production, you know, not just focusing on what's happening in the development lifecycle, completely agree. It has to be across the supply chain. But one of the challenges is um, performing patches for issues that exist um, because you're not going to, you know, it's all about security is all about risk and you're not going to be able to distill most applications have flaws. Right. That's the reality we're living in. And that, you know, harks back to, I think, what Jeff is saying is that we haven't necessarily security hasn't been able to move the needle despite, you know, record levels of investment, investment in it. And there are inherent challenges in, 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 in patching, you know, applications. There's a lot of anxiety for teams, operations team teams around patching production applications. It can take days, weeks or even months uh, to, to detect and, and, and patch um, uh, an issue in production. But one of the things that, you know, we've been focused on is, it, are the issues that you're looking at, are they actually exploitable? You know, so assessing true exploitability is really important because that's going to help you prevent unplanned work with the risk associated with it. It's going to reduce the resource burden in an already resource constrained domain. And last but not least, there's already limited collaboration between application development and security teams. So up leveling the veracity of the information shared between these teams um, reduces the load and helps to reduce the friction. And the last point I'd make is um, in terms of tracking, you know, where risk is from development lifecycle to production. Uh, and this comes back to, you know, the, the declaration around this software bill of materials. I think you heard it mentioned earlier um, uh, in, in the conversation. You know, that is that is that is going to help because changing culture, um, th there's a soft approach and a hard approach. And a hard approach sometimes is these directives that helps to create a landscape where organizations are, um, they need to commit to having a clear understanding of their software bill of materials. So, for example, if you uh, have a clear understanding of your software bill of materials pre-production and you push that into production, you can monitor to see if that software bill of materials has changed, right? We, and you can, and, and if it has changed, change, how did it change? What's the risk associated with that change? What was the risk associated when you pushed it? This is really going to up-level the information that teams and customers of software producers uh, uh, have when it comes to understanding the risk of software, both sorry, uh, in, in their own software and supply chain risk, which we've seen has been a, a huge issue. And I think of what was driving the directive in the first place. I, I didn't totally get that. Like if the software changes in production, something else is really wrong. That should never happen. But it does. We still have- Well, sure. But I mean, the problem is not that the, the library got updated. The problem is that you got hacked. It's already not over if the software changes in production. Not necessarily. Well, if, I mean, like, your process should course, protect you, against that. You, you, I think you could the, get the, hacked. The but, big but problem that you raised, always protect against it. I think the more interesting problem that you raised is the exploitability of vulnerabilities. And you know, when you find a vulnerability in custom code, it's generally exploitable because the way that you found it, you know, probably involved looking at the code or watching it at runtime or doing a pen test or something. So you know it's exploitable. But the library problems, most people identify them just because the library happens to be there, maybe in the source code repo. Well, there's a long distance between that and being exploitable. So a couple of facts. First of all, what's in your source code repo doesn't represent what's in production. There are mm -hmm. libraries that are in the source code repo that are used for test environments and things that don't make it into production. And there's a lot of libraries that are in production that aren't in the source code repo things that come from your app server and your runtime are, are you know, really important for security, but not analyzed. So I think it's better to analyze them at runtime. And as Julius mentioned earlier, one great technique to find out whether that code actually runs is to use instrumentation at runtime to see what pieces of those libraries are invoked. And we just published a big study about this. It's fascinating. Only 6% of open source code in an application ever runs. Many, many libraries, over half, are never invoked at all. And mm -hmm. so the fastest, most powerful thing you can do to rule out all those false positives is to understand which libraries actually run in the production environment mm -hmm. and so then make sure you upgrade those libraries. That's kind yeah, of interesting. No, I, I agree with that point for sure. And, and, and just, just, the, the one thing oh, just, I'd add to that 
it just just really quickly is you're absolutely right continuous monitoring is going to happen in it well it could happen in stage for for example as well as production right it doesn't necessarily it could be sure. in a pre-prod environment but you can you you can do it earlier you can shift that lift as well you can do dynamic scanning of images that you're going to use for example a, a golden image that's being layered with your um, software components at the application level uh, as part of an SEA scan as well. Uh, and you can track the code provenance, what came through my software repository, what has gone through um, to be um, tested in stage, what has gone to a pre-production environment, and then what goes into production. And you can take a look at the software bill of materials at each stage to take a look to see in production where the code has come from. Did it come from any of the checks in my authoritative um, um, uh, software? Yeah, I, I get it. I'm, I'm just saying which code actually runs is, you, you is know, a I, huge I part of this point. decision. But what I'm, saying is, what I'm saying is that the, the, it, a lot of process is put around a, a, a pipeline or a software development lifecycle. So understanding through looking at the software bill of materials and being able to audit what it looks like at each stage, you can assess the risk of am I seeing software in production that even came from that software supply chain? Is there code provenance there? And if not, what is the risk that is at pre uh, present? But you're right. We've done similar testing to see that um, most of the uh, libraries associated with um, open source code, these are packages that never get run. And that, that's where you're taking a look at moving the needle in terms of understanding true exploitable risks. It's so not I, I separate from the SBOM, by the way. The SBOM should reflect which libraries actually run in production, uh, ah. you know, that are actually used part of the application. So, so let me jump so in. Two I'm going right? to do, do a, a, I'm I'm do a ref one, timeout. One thing, okay, hold on. So for, time for out, the... time out. No, no, time out. So we have about eight minutes left, and I want to I want to give some guidance to folks. I appreciate all the conversation. I feel like I'm leading a team of horses and <laughs> really wants to run, which is great. Uh, so I'd like us just to wrap with, if you were in the audience's shoes, someone who's a practitioner, where, where do you help either yourself or your colleagues start to think about application security differently? What kind of resources, uh, training or certifications could be part of it? What other, what other ways we can help each other transform our idea about AppSec and how we do some of the, take some of the approaches that we're taking. Steven, do you want, I'm gonna ask you to go first. I know it's a little unfair to be first when I just asked the question. So I'm trying to give you a little bit of time to think about it. No, 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 because I, I, I do have an immediate response to that. And it's something that, that I was thinking about earlier. And, and that is that there's a responsibility right at the top level within an organization. You only have to look at some of the, the you know, I, I've been looking at use cases, you know, some of the cases, reasons why there have been breaches. And a large part of it is because the business themselves have not treated security as a value. They are seeing it as a cost. They're not seeing it as something which actually represents value to their organization. That's something that's changing over the last few years, especially with what's happened with COVID, with the pandemic, a lot more people being online, and there's been a lot more shift in terms of the kinds of attacks and cyber attacks that are going on. And that is that organizations at the top level, at the very top level, at, at that C-suite level, need to understand that security within your software, within your IT business, within your IT infrastructure, has to be treated as a business value you need to have it as part of your business success criteria if you can turn around to your customers and prove that you have security built in that you are always looking to implement security and that you really do treat it as a value that should cascade down throughout your organization and should be a real driver to within your organization to take that responsibility in ensuring everything is secure. Now, that's not the be-all and end-all answer. I just think that's a really good starting point. Okay. And I'll leave that now to hand over to somebody else. Okay. To, to, to what the we have two thing. minutes. And yeah. jump in there, Julius. Why don't you go next? Um, yeah, for me, I mean, I imagine the audience here is probably a mix of like, you know, very advanced, mature AppSec programs in place, uh, you know, in the middle of the road and then just starting out. And uh, But for all three of them, you know, 
maybe this is just me. Uh, what's that phrase? Uh, chasing the dragon there. But that experience I had 10 years ago was incredible. So if you could ever bring in an auditor, an AppSec professional, have them spend time with your code, with your systems, and then have them uh, give training to your development team. That was an incredible experience. And I, I think that lifted the whole org there for definitely like six to 12 months on the AppSec front. Great. Awesome. Jeff, why don't you jump in? Yeah, my advice, uh, if you had to focus on one thing, is to uh, shoot for what I call security and sunshine. Like create visibility around, or, or better observability around everything related to application security. And it's a little, you know, it subsumes a little bit of uh, Stephen's point because uh, when you when you make application security visible and part of sort of the definition of done, then I believe, and I've seen you know, organizations do the right thing. But as long as uh, security kind of stays hidden in uh, PDF reports and uh, hidden in various bug trackers and things like that, it doesn't get the, the proper visibility. And so then executives can't make the right decisions about you know, where to invest and, and why. But I just think uh, you know, that's a real game changer. And hopefully that's what we're doing in the market writ large by pushing concepts like security labels and S-bombs and, and so on, we're flipping on the lights so that everyone can see it. And my experience, and I've, I've done many of the kinds of sessions that Julius was talking about with companies. I've done, I've trained thousands of developers and to a person, everyone is interested in doing the right thing. Once you show them the, once you flip on the lights, then everyone does the right thing. So that's what I focus on. Great, Curtis, why don't you bring it home for us? Yeah, I think one of the really important things uh, organizations are starting to do, and we've seen this with, you know, establishing kind of mean time to remediate and things like that is setting up goals and outcomes that they want to achieve when it comes to security and then having um, metrics in place to measure how they are achieving those goals over time. Um, and then allow the, um, the, the teams to, to make investments, in, invest in it um, and make it a priority of investment. I, I, I've been a product manager for a long time and I used to have to uh, add security as part of some of the build that I did. And it wasn't the most sexy thing to put at the top of the roadmap. However, if there are metrics and goals that incentivize me as a product person to build in security into the product that I'm shipping, it's going to be something that I'm more likely to do if there's more pressure and visibility uh, as to the risk as part of my code base. Um, then, and, and that's going to be, you know, th th there's going to be a focus on that when I ship it, that's going to incentivize me as well. So having um, uh, goals, having the right metrics to measure how you're tracking against those goals uh, and clear visibility uh, and um, investment to allow teams to make the, the necessary investments uh, along a roadmap to achieve those outcomes, I think is, is vitally important. Well, fantastic. What a great group. Really appreciate all of you. I want to thank each of you, Jeff Williams, co-founder and CTO with Contrast, Stephen Walters, a solution architect with Everbridge, Curtis, uh, thank you for wrapping it up there with Curtis, VP of Product Strategy, Field CTO with Resilient, and Julius uh, Musso, CTO and co-founder with MergeBase, and also to Manish Gupta, who dropped off for technical difficulties, uh, Manish, who's CT CEO with Shift Left. You know, just one parting thought. I often hear sort of the developers being blamed for writing insecure code or unsecure. I'm not sure about insecure. But, and I always tell people, there's no developer who wants to write unsecure code. Nobody wants to do that. They don't do that on purpose. So I think us working and helping each other um, improve the state of the art, improve security for all of us is a great benefit. And if I could put a plug in too, and a thanks to our, uh, the folks who put on today's webinar, the folks at DevOps Institute, a lot of great training on DevSecOps and and security as well as DevOps and other areas. And I know your ambassador, Stephen, you you believe in the program as well. A lot of good folks there, a lot of good resources as well as many others. So thank you to each of you. Uh, really, really great conversation. I hope we can do it again. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day, everyone. Bye.